Welcome to Aspen Ideas. My name is Charlotte Alter. I'm a senior correspondent at Time, and I'm so excited to be joined here by Whitney Wolf Hurd, founder and CEO of Bumble. Hey, Whitney, how are you? Hi, Charlotte. Great to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's so great to see you again. Um, I feel like this has been such an exciting year for you with Bumble going public and with all of the exciting uh, new adventures in sort of online relationship building that we've seen in the last year. Um, I'm wondering, you know, you this year you took your company public. You became one of the youngest self-made women billionaires in the world. Um, how is Bumble different than all of these other sort of uh, social discovery apps because of who you are, because of your experience as a young woman in, in this field? Yeah, well, it has been a crazy year for sure. Um, I think everyone is, you know, losing track days, months, weeks, years. Uh, it's all blending together at this point. But so what I, what I think sets Bumble apart is that, you know, we built this with the lens of what does a woman want when she builds relationships and what does a woman not want, maybe even more importantly, right? And when you look at the beginning of this chapter of this story of Bumble is 2014 and I would say two things were fundamentally true and clear actually three things so thing one that the internet had really no stance on toxicity or harassment and it was pretty much a free-for-all uh, you could say what you wanted to say even if it was going to cause someone extreme pain grief and emotional maybe even physical um, trauma. Thing two is that this was um, 2014, as I said, and it was still incredibly uh, stigmatized for a woman to approach a man, if we're talking about heteronormative, heterosexual relationships, to approach a man first at a bar or on a product, a digital product, or, you know, in any kind of format. And then the third thing was there was this emergence of online dating. It was just starting to explode. But the reality was as fast as it exploded, it very much turned into a um, mechanism for harassment, abuse, and bad behavior. So that exploded with it. And so, you know, my approach with Bumble was really looking at all three of those things and understanding where do they intersect and how can we try to solve for these things with a product brand company all aim to put women at the forefront versus making them the afterthought. So one of the things that I think is so interesting about Bumble is that you've set out to build an app that, uh, you know, want, aims to sort of use the internet to shape the way humans behave both online and off. I'm curious what you've learned about human behavior on the way. You know, you've been doing this now for a couple of years. What has surprised you? Yeah, a lot has surprised me, uh, fortunately and unfortunately. Something that has really surprised me is the power of rejection and just mm -hmm. how powerful that one moment can be and how it can define what happens next. So what has surprised me is when people feel rejected, it almost creates this inherent um, negativity, obsession, and insecurity, which then leads to all sorts of things like harassment, abuse, toxicity. And it's been fascinating to me how quickly someone can feel rejected on the internet, right? If someone doesn't respond to them or someone says something they don't like, it just breeds this insecurity that we all you know, do see in real life. But the other thing that has surprised me is the power of positivity. Um, it's actually shocking to see the data, and we have a lot of it. When you send a non-punitive warning uh, and you make it more of a hand-holding kind uh, reminder, it is fascinating to see what happens. So if you take this lens of punishment or punitive uh, action, people don't respond well to that. People really want to defend themselves and they want to stand up for themselves and they want to blame, right? And it's really remarkable to see what happens when you say things like please or you add a smiley face or you add a heart. It just softens the entire 
reaction and we've done this from day one so you know our product has always been about speaking to the customer in a kind manner and we've used bees as our mechanism to translate that that's been our translation is and by the way like a whole nother tangent is the this like incredible society of bees right the way the bees all behave it's just like a, an amazing ecosystem so we've really taken this this positivity positivity approach and it really translates to real data and real um, real beneficial outcomes in terms of how people shift their behavior. So if you have someone that was upset about something, if you resp respond to them with kindness, all of a sudden they're like, thank you so much. I'm so sorry that I was mean. Please forgive me. It just creates this like contagious kindness reaction. And so that's been really fascinating. So I'm kind of curious, you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about a little bit uh, in our various other conversations is this idea that so many other tech CEOs from Mark Zuckerberg to Jack Dorsey to sort of like the, the masters of the universe of tech bros um, have spent the last, uh, you know, couple of years, really since the 2016 election, essentially arguing that things that happen on their platform are not their problem <laughs> or that the, the, or, or that the way uh, people behave on Facebook or Twitter is not something that is uh, their responsibility. I'm curious what you think of that stance um, and why you might have a slightly different approach. Well, I think they believe that, right? I think they actually fundamentally believe that. I think that if you look at these products, none of them were created with the intention of solving for bad behavior. None of them were created with intentionality around changing behavior for better outcomes, right? These platforms were basically built to provide access and that's it. It was an access point, right? How do I connect person A to connect person B in the quickest way possible? How do I allow someone to say whatever they want in this town hall format? I, you can't put things back into a box, right? Once things are out there, they're out there. And I don't even think it's just these CEOs. I think that it's their customer base, right? So you can't just knock on the door of customers 10 years in and say, hey, by the way, you can't do this anymore. We're, we've changed our mind. There's a new set of rules. Why I believe it works at Bumble is we've done this from day one. I mean, if you were to look at our very first script of wireframing, right, 2014 mock-ups, the even pre-Bumble mock-up was called Moxie with the safety pin. The safety pin was our icon before it was Bumble with the Hive to insinuate that this is a safer platform that will have your back. This is going to engineer a kinder, more respectful uh, you know, set of behavior and, 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 and engagement. And not only that, but we're going to name our product Moxie, which means to have bravery and to be, to, you know, have gall and to you know, go for it. And so that was the pre-brand before Bumble. So, you know, when you think about the intentionality behind everything we did, I mean, from the, the, the push notifications, right? From what the screen says to you, this was all engineered strategically to create a kinder, less toxic environment. And the, the reality is those other products just weren't, right? And so they've never felt that they've promised that or that that's their responsibility. Now, do I agree with their approach? Obviously, I have a very different, you know, um, mindset on this topic. But that's truly what I believe is they just, they never promised to be this, right? And now they've got this, this systemic issue that I think is one of the biggest issues of this generation and certainly the next generation because if you look at screen time, you know, children live on their phones more than they do in real life now. And who are they engaging with? So on that note, you know, what do you think, I, I think a lot of people are concerned about what you just said. Um, what do you think, how does the tech industry need to change in order to um, embrace sort of more humanity on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I think you can't be scared to kick someone out of the bar, right? Even if they're a good customer, buy another metric, even if they buy a lot of beers, right? 
if they behave poorly, they need to be kicked out of the bar and the digital version of that. And that's, that's my fundamental belief and setting a set of guidelines and setting a set of, um, you know, current guidelines that actually take care of current modern issues. And for example, you know, Bumble uh, just has added, we've, we've been doing a lot of education work on the leadership team and across the board. And our team has really helped us see some of the discrepancies that we missed, like fetishization or body shaming. You know, we always said there's no harassment allowed here. Or there's no, you know, abuse allowed here, but there, that's very nuanced. There's a lot of nuances to those words, right? And so we've gone and constantly optimized and said, you cannot use our product to behave this way. You cannot body shame. You cannot shame someone for their age or their ability or their health. And these are things that I don't know, maybe they are, but I don't know if these other companies are necessarily thinking about this, right? Because there's a lot of other stuff going on. So I think you just have to pick what do you care about as a company and who are you trying to protect and what problem are you trying to solve? And then you have to hold yourself accountable to that. And when you have to start kicking people off your product when they don't agree with it, you have to be okay with that. And so, you know, it's, it's funny because this is something that I think is bubbling up in a lot on a lot of different platforms right now, not just um, relationship building platforms like yours. So, but what do you say to people who say, you know, uh, I'm being kicked off for an unfair reason or I have a right to exist on the internet? Do you think people have a right to exist on these platforms on the, on the internet? I think that if there are no terms and conditions and there are no guidelines, it is very hard to argue against that, right? But when you have very clear terms and conditions that someone has agreed to saying, I will not call somebody these names, or I will not use hate speech, or I will not shame someone for X, Y, and Z. And when they do that, you can point back to their 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 um, invasion of that. It's, it's very similar to business in the streets, right? There might be a pizza shop that says no shirt, no shoes, no service. And if you walk in without shoes and a shirt, you're going to be asked to leave, but the sign is on the wall, it's on the door. So if you don't have that sign on the door, I know I'm using this metaphorical kind of analogy for, for, for rules, but if you don't have that sign on the door and you just tell someone to leave, you're going to have people that don't understand why. So I think you know these companies need to have their own digital sign on the door, whatever they stand for. And if if certain businesses don't want to enforce that, that's their own thing to worry about. But that's how you start shifting behavior, in my opinion, is you have to decide what sign are you going to put on the door and hold people accountable. And so what I'm curious what you and Bumble really have learned through the pandemic. Um, what, you know, what has the pandemic taught you about how people build relationships, how they maintain relationships when they can't physically see each other, and sort of uh, how important actual in-person contact is to, you know, to, to building a good relationship. Yeah, I mean, this has been so fascinating. I mean, truly, we are a relationship company, right? Like we, we, we exist because we help people go meet each other. So you can imagine March 2020 was a very confusing time, but our recent survey has been so amazing in the sense that it has illuminated all of these truths that we've been seeing through our data, but now it's kind of justified by customer feedback that the stigma around online dating is essentially gone, right? It is essentially gone. And 65% of the survey respondents said that they believe they can fall in love without meeting someone in real life first, that they can actually form such a deep connection with someone digitally, whether that's using our FaceTime product or using audio features, or even just communicating through writing, they fundamentally believe 65% are open to and believe that they can find love without meeting in person. And so, you know, that is a shocking statistic. And the other shocking statistic that has come out of this is that, yeah, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll have to pull it up for you at some point, that a lot of people want to meet through video before they actually meet in real life. So the digital barrier actually is a prerequisite for a lot of women now, meaning 
I actually prefer to meet whomever on a dating app because I've seen 10 of their photos, I've read their bio, I know so much more about this individual than I would have ever gathered at a coffee shop. And to make sure he's not someone I'm scared of or someone I'm unattracted to, I'm going to do a five minute video date, even three minute video date, make sure this person is someone I have chemistry with and then meet them in real life. And it's been really um, amazing. And I think the statistics around 40% prefer video first dating before they actually meet in real life. So that's a remarkable statistic that did not exist before the pandemic, even though we had conviction in that, the pandemic almost solidified that in a strange but positive way, I would say, because it really enforces safety and not wasting your time and you know, understanding who you're about to meet. So Whitney, before we have to wrap up, I just have to ask you, what's next for Bumble? What do you see coming, coming next for this innovative company? Yeah, so we have a lot of exciting things on the horizon. I think the best way to bundle it for you is that we see our global team and our global, call it Bumble Inc. mission as creating healthy and equitable relationships for all, meaning all communities. And the way we do this is through building technology that is accountable, kind, and safe. Uh, and so when you think about that at the group level, um, that gives us a lot of opportunity both to continuously reinvest in Bumble app, which really focuses on women around the world, right? If you think about the shocking statistics around women's rights, you know, there's dozens of countries that still don't allow women to have basic fundamental rights and they need approvals from their husbands to, you know, travel or do certain things. And so when you think about what Bumble app is still trying to solve for, it's incredibly vast. You know, there's over 3 billion women on the planet, 1.8 billion are single. Um, and when you think about that opportunity, that's really where we believe Bumble app is going to stay extremely focused. But then what's exciting about our group, Bumble Inc., is that our commitment to helping all communities, all individuals find healthy and equitable relationships with this safe, empowered, accountable and kinder technology that gives us this vast opportunity to build both new products for granular communities. When you think about the growth of the LGBTQIA plus community on Bumble app, it's sensational, yet they don't feel that Bumble app is optimized for them yet, right? And so this gives us a remarkable opportunity to look at either M&A or to build ourselves. And then there's dozens of others, other communities that we have started to identify that really need dedicated product, dedicated focus. But what's so exciting about this is when you zoom up to the Bumble Inc. level and you think about our commitment to legislation, to customer obsession, to safety, security, privacy, that all stays at this Inc. level and gives us an ability to really go down and advocate and create legislation for the LGBTQIA plus community to go uh, advocate and create safer technology for another community that feels disadvantaged. And so when you think about this hive of opportunity ahead of us, it's incredibly vast and much more vast than what exists today. And so there's a big vision here to really, um, you know, have all communities backs as it comes, as it pertains to them finding healthy, equitable relationships and beyond love, of course. So that's kind of the way we're thinking about things high level. We're very excited. Oh, and by the way, we're opening our first coffee shop in New York, Charlotte, so you have to go. It opens in July. It's very, very cute and bumbly, and it's on Kenmare Street, so we'll give you more details. I will definitely go get, go there. <laughs> I, I will okay. go anywhere where there's iced coffee. Um, great. Well, Whitney, <laughs> Whitney Wolfhard, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such a fun conversation. Thanks, Charlotte.